possibility of taking on new missionaries? What are we going to do along those lines? So I want to use today really as preparation for Wednesday's meeting. Wednesday's going to be really preparation for the end of the month, and I hope that you'll be here for all of that. It really is a privilege as a local church to be involved in really selecting and praying and being involved in worldwide New Testament missions. And so uh, I really think it's important that we just kind of do some reviewing. So today is a review. Hope there's something there that you'll uh, latch on to here and really, again, meditate and think on as we go our separate ways. But, but uh, I trust the Lord will bless our time together here in His Word. Let's ask for His blessing or it would all be in the flesh, and we don't want that to be the case. Father, we are grateful for our time here this morning, and thankful again for the songs we've sung, um, for the special music that we've heard, for the emphasis on our missionary, the Scherzers, uh, and the great job they're doing there in Belize. Uh, Lord, uh, we're thankful for the scripture that has already been read to us, and we may just make a quick review back into that passage later on here today. But Lord, we're looking to you to really open up those windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us as we study your word together, as we're reminded of uh, missions, a love of yours, which ought ought to be a love of ours. And uh, Lord, we want to do it right. Uh, We want to do missions right. Uh, we, We know that our time and our finances are limited. And uh, Father, we need wisdom as to really uh, how to go about the work you've called us to do in getting the gospel into all the world. And so I pray, Father, that you use today to really uh, speak to us and challenge us and prepare us for decisions that need to be made even yet this week and later this month. And we're going to thank you for it. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Okay, so listen, I'd like to always uh, at least get your wheels spinning a little bit here by asking a question or two here, and that would be question number one. Does the word mission, missions, or missionary appear in our King James Bible anywhere? And the answer to that is? Okay, that means only about five of you are definitive with no. Those five are correct. There is no word mission, there is no word missions, plural, or missionary in our Bible. There is a word, and we're going to come back to that, that means the very same thing. Can anybody guess what that word would be? Real fast, real fast. Anybody know what the word mission or where we get the word mission from? It's the word apostle in English. Okay, so we're going to look at that here just a little bit. Uh, Question number two, really, I know question number one and a half wasn't really a question on my radar here, but question number two, how many missionaries do we support? Well, if you got here early enough and you opened up that little packet of information, you could probably count those missionaries. Uh, but there are 13 that we are currently supporting. Now, I have to tell you something real fast with regard to that. There are some churches that will have 100 missionaries, and to each their own. This is, this is the prerogative of a local church. They can make these decisions however they want to. Kendall Park Baptist, we're kind of balanced in this area that we'd like to give more to the missionaries that we support, making their job a little bit easier when they come home on furlough so that they don't have to run around to all these churches. I just want you to think about it. Let's just say a missionary, uh, uh, such as, uh, let's say, Barry Bayless. We'll pick on him. Barry has been supported by our church for many years. I think he's close to 20 years. I could be wrong, give or take. I'm going to guess somewhere in the area, 19, 20 years. I don't know how many churches Barry has, but let's just say Barry has 40 churches that, he, uh, that support him. And by the way, you understand why churches support missionaries? They cannot go to countries like Spain and other places and take a local a, a job away from the local people, from the national. So they have to go there fully supported uh, in order to have a house, to have a place of ministry, to be involved in all those kind of things. They have to be supported. And so what they do is they go from church to church, present their burden to churches like Kendall Park Baptist and say, hey, God has called me to serve him in the country of Spain. And, uh, and I really believe that we need to get over there and begin to plant a church, win souls to Christ and get a church established. And so, hey, listen, we are going. And they will go from church to church asking for prayer support as well as financial support. They must generate so much money for them to be able to go over there and live, be able to put a roof over their head, food on their table, clothes on their back, just like you and I in America, as well as set up a place of ministry. 
So they often will have a place like a, uh, they might have a storefront if they're getting started. Sometimes they'll have their, their, their ministry start in their own homes. And so the home has to be big enough to be able to house some of these people to come in there and do Bible studies. As the Bible study grows, they might go get a storefront. All of that costs money. And so the money that they generate from churches is what enables them to stay on the field year after year after year. So some churches believe, well, listen, when they come home, that's a tedious task. If they have 40 churches to get to, and usually their, their furlough is roughly about a year's worth of time, there's only 52 weeks in a year. That's 40 of the 52 weeks they are running from different churches, presenting an update to those churches, giving a report to those churches as to how things are going in Spain or Madagascar or in France or wherever else it might be. So there's a philosophy saying, hey, listen, let's give more to these missionaries, thereby limiting the amount of churches they have to report to and, uh, and make it a little bit easier on them. And so there are some missionaries, for instance, we support the Bayless at $700 a month. $700 a month, every month, Kendall Park Baptist sends to the Baylesses to say, hey, listen, we are with you in your ministry there in Spain. And uh, we are longing to hear of souls getting saved and believers getting baptized and people joining a church and same things that we're doing here in America, they're doing over there. Now, Bayless's and Browns, they get a little bit more than most of our missionaries, and that's because they've been sent out of our church. They are people that are from our church that have been sent to the field from Kendall Park. We're their, we're their sending, yea, commissioning church. So those missionaries we try to take care of a little bit better than others. But I say all of that to say there are others that like to say, boy, every missionary that comes through our door, we'd like to take them on for support. Well, we would all like to do that. For instance, we just had four great missionaries at our conference here. Remember their names real fast? Good, that's one. Fry, two. Shrocks, three. O'Malley is four, yes. And by the way, Brother O'Malley, even though he is the president of Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions, he still needs support as well. Sometimes we overlook that. Just because he's the president of an agency doesn't mean that he doesn't have to have support. And so he has churches that support him in his endeavor to be the administrator of that particular agency. So all four of those individuals are worthy of our support. So there are some churches say, hey, listen, let's get behind them and support them. And they say, okay, that's a great idea. Very noble. How much are we going to support them for? Well, we all know money doesn't grow on trees, and we don't have a lot of money, so hey, let's support them all for $50 a month. Okay, we could do that. And listen, that might be the desire of Kendall Park when we meet and talk about some of these things. But $50 a month, I don't know about you, but that's not going too far today anymore. It might have maybe 20 years ago, but $50 isn't going a whole lot further today. So there are churches saying, no, we don't want to do that. No, listen, our base usually support for most of our missionaries, we start at like $200 a month. So if we take on all four, that's $800 a month. That's, all. that's a chunk of change. Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from the folks that are sitting here today that, again, are involved in the missions process. And so uh, we kind of work our way through all of that and decide, well, that's pretty ambitious to take on all four as much as we'd like to do that. We're really not in a position to do that at $200 a month or maybe $300 a month or whatever it might be. So, hey, let's just take on maybe one of those four missionaries. And sometimes that's how it goes. So that's how we get to where we are today. And the 13 that we'll have, if you look at that insert in that little thing that we gave you, there are the 13 missionaries. Baptist Children's Home and the project there in India are one and the same. That's one agency. We just sent a check for 150. That would be one of our smaller supported missionaries. And, uh, and uh, we'd send that off to them, and they, they have uh, housing for, mission, uh, for children, orphans, all over India, uh, Myanmar, Nepal, Liberia, here in America, a number of different places. But other than that, you can look at, take a look at the missionaries that we support. And there's about 13 of them, if I count it correctly here. Okay, and just one other introductory remark before we get into the word here. I want you to know this. Um, there's all kinds of missionaries. Even in the recent conference that we just had with the missionaries, there was a unique ministry that we've never had before here at Kendall Park. And that would be the Fry Ministry. Nathan Fry, his ministry is called Lens of the Harvest. And he is gifted with a camera, a video camera. Uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, I don't know what the other kind of cameras are. They're not 35 millimeter cameras anymore. What are those cameras now anymore? They're just nice cameras. What are they? Photographer. photographer. So he's a photographer. And he's skilled in that area. And so he can go to places that you and I can't go to. For instance, remember 
uh, the peelers as they served on that island, uh, Recora, was it Recora or something like that? Uh, something like that. What is it? Nakoro. Nakor Nakoro. Thank you, Nakoro. They, uh, they're serving over there. Hey, through the lens of the harvest, he could put together a presentation that could be really presented here in the United States that could really speak to our hearts, knowing full well that most of us will probably never get to that island, and they're in need of a missionary. And so he uses his skills to bring awareness to people about small islands of less than 300 people that need to have a faithful gospel witness. And so God's given him some talents and abilities, and he's using the Fry family in that area. I think that's tremendous. Your skill set may be different than my skill set, different than some of the missionaries that were here, but listen, all of us have something we can offer the cause of Christ, and with that skill set, we need to be involved in serving the Lord. Now, some of these individuals sense a special call in their lives to say, hey, I'm going to devote all of my life, all of my time and energy and finances to a particular mission field. Whether it's going to be with a camera in, in your face all day long, or rather going over to the Ivory Coast, or going to Israel, or wherever it is, I sense God has put a call in my heart and my life to go and minister to these people to see souls get saved and churches established, and it's all for the glory of God. So, there's two different kinds of ministries. There are church planning ministries, then there are teaching ministries. Um, I found it really interesting, and uh, I'm going to pick on Sam Abraham. Uh, we were, had an opportunity to visit yesterday with uh, the Abrahams and just had a great time. And, and uh, Sam was reminding me of the day he got saved, and I, I, I didn't remember a lot of the details, but I asked him, when was it? He said 2019, and he remembers the date. It was March 17th. Uh, I said, March 17th? I said, that should have been around our missions conference. He said, yeah, it was. I said, well, who led you to the Lord? He said, Tom Wolf. And I said, oh, bless my soul. I guess he was here for that missions conference in 2019. Now, what do you know about Tom Wolf? Well, Tom Wolf was a former pastor of Kendall Park Baptist Church. He was here for a number of years. And then God called him to be the dean of a school that I would have the privilege of later on attending and sitting under his ministry. I didn't know Tom Wolf from Adam, other than he ends up in the same church that I am, and I sit under his ministry for a number of years learning from him. Well, Tom's gift really is teaching. He's a teacher at heart. He is a gifted teacher. And so he's really devoted his life to teaching. And he travels all over the world establishing seminaries and schools and working with curriculum and pastors and teachers and just really trying to, again, bolster their program of educating men. And, yea, there are women who want to serve in full-time ministry. And so Tom's ministry is a teacher, and we support teaching-type ministries like Tom. But then there are just church planning ministries, and it doesn't say that they don't do any teaching but their goal is, again, to see souls get saved and baptized and join a local church and, and grow a church and have a, a, have a witness in a community. People like the Scherzers. You just heard about those folks this morning. They're doing a phenomenal job there in Belize. They've only been down there for a few years, but they came to one of our missions conferences, presented their burden. Church liked what we heard. Not that we didn't like any of the others, but listen, we thought, well, we're going to get on that team there. And so we have supported the churchers now for a number of years. And they are doing as what they told us they were going to do. Go to Belize, win souls to Christ, plant a church, grow a church, see people discipled in Christ. They're doing everything they told us they were going to do. That's a church planning ministry versus a teaching ministry. Tom's ministry different. We like to believe that we have a balanced portfolio here. Oh, that almost sounds really uh, financially savvy here. But what we would like to be is we'd like to have a number of church planners and a number of teachers balanced to, to, our, to our missions program. Not all heavy on just teaching ministries. Not all heavy just on agency type ministries. But hey, church planners, teachers. And that's really what we have. And so, hey, what we have on this list here, I went through the list real quick here, church planners. Bayless's, Browns, Northcuts, Polanco's, Scherzer's. Five of them is what I counted. Now, there are some overlap here. Uh, teachers, clearly teachers, primarily teachers. I put down Days, McCubbins, uh, Shalom Ministries, and Wolfs. There's four of them, five church planners. What about the others? Well, some of them are doing a combination of them. For instance, Raymond Abu McHale. Raymond Abu McHale is a phenomenal missionary in Lebanon. He's a Lebanese person. Uh, that's, that's his native land. And so he's, he's planning a church, but he's also got online seminary. 
And he's doing an incredible job over there, reaching, again, the Muslim population in the neighboring countries that you and I could not get into if we wanted to. We cannot go to Saudi Arabia and say, hey, listen, I'm here in Saudi Arabia to be a missionary. They would say, thanks, but no thanks. Pack your bags and get out of here. You can't go to Jordan. You can't go to Iraq, Iran. They don't want us there. They're, they're a very closed country. But listen, with, with online ministries, you can do incredible stuff. You can get into those countries by way of those airwaves. And, and, uh, and so Raymond Abu is doing both. He's got a full-time job and really trying to keep up with uh, online classes and teaching, as well as planning a church right there in Beirut. And then, uh, then, let's see, the other one would be the Nelsons. The Nelsons are doing a church plant as well. They are also involved in seminary teaching and stuff to some degree over there. Uh, I have Tri-State Bible Camp is really more of a uh, kind of a teaching. Uh, I don't know how to put the camp down there as a ministry. Uh, they certainly, their, their goal is to see souls get saved, believers strengthened in their walk with the Lord. But they send them back to the local churches of that sort. So... I don't know what category to put that one in. But you understand the violence portfolio, it's exclusively church planning, some more teaching. And our goal would be to have kind of a balance in all of that. And so that's where we are with that. Now, let me just ask you a couple things real quick here with regard to the word mission. So I've already said, what is the word mission? Well, the word mission, by way of definition, really, is this idea of the act of sending. That's what an apostle is. If you look up the word apostle or apostolo, uh, it means one sent. It, it is one that has been sent. And that's what a missionary, you can pick up a dictionary, pull it up. It's one that is sent or being sent. Uh, they are being sent or delegated by an authority uh, with certain powers for transacting business. Missionaries come, they go. We have sent a couple from our own church. They go representing the Lord. They go representing our church. Uh, their goal, is, again, is to represent the Lord and our local church well. Uh, Melanie just got back from visiting two of our missionaries in Europe there. She could tell, tell you, give you a report, that, uh, and I, I haven't even caught up with her yet. But if she attended both of their services in Spain and in France, you would feel very comfortable in those churches, just like you would in America. The only difference would be language. So if you know Spanish or you know French, you would, you would understand everything going on. Hymns they sing, the preaching, the ministry, very identical. And so uh, these are individuals that are sent out, and they're going there with a specific reason. Preach the gospel to people that need to hear. And so we're grateful for missions, worldwide missions. It's a great, great ministry. Here's what I want to look at in the time that we have this morning. I want to look at our authority with regard to missions here at KBPC. I want to look at our assets as well as our autonomy, our autonomy. So three areas. Let's begin with our authority for missions here at Kendall Park Baptist. Matthew chapter 28 is the passage of scripture you're open to. And uh, I want you to see this. Matthew 28 verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, you are very familiar with the rest of the verses here that go on and talk about uh, the Great Commission. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them, etc. You got that all down. It was only a couple of weeks ago I spent some time in this text here. But I want you to see something about the authority. This word here in verse 18, Jesus is now raised from the grave. He has already presented himself now to the disciples and a number of other people. He's uh, getting ready to ascend back into the presence of his father. He meets with his disciples one more time, and he wants them to know this. All power is given unto me. Now, that almost goes without saying. You know why all power is his? He is God. He is sovereign. He already had all the power. But he's going to remind these disciples there that are with him that day, hey, all power is given unto me. That word power is not the word that we get dynamite from. This is a different word from which we get the idea of authority. Authority, one that is in control, uh, one, that, one that, again, uh, uh, is, is empowering or dictating or leading others. This authority is in Christ. And he's going to, as it were, in my understanding, transfer that th authority to his disciples. All authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. As a result of that authority, I commission you followers of mine, you disciples, to go with the gospel. 
Teaching has the idea of discipling all nations. In order to disciple a believer, they got to be one to Christ. We go with the gospel, we see him get saved, and then we disciple these individuals. Part of the discipling process is baptizing them in one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, three persons, one name, because there's only one God. This authority was transferred, I believe, to the disciples. We, we in and of ourselves, cannot go with the gospel apart from the power of Christ. If you go, you go in the flesh, and the flesh is weak and vulnerable. We are susceptible for, to failure. But when we go with the gospel, whether it's local missions or whether it's foreign missions, hey, we go with the authority of Christ. We go with the power of God upon our lives to preach the gospel. That ought to encourage you. That, that ought to bless your heart. I, I'm, I'm thankful that, listen, if I knock on a door in my community, I need to remind myself, hey, listen, it may be me in the flesh that's knocking on the door, but I have the power of Christ upon my life to speak boldly the truth of God. And I speak it in love. I'm not there as a know-it-all. I'm not there as a, con a condemning individual. I'm just there to tell them, hey, listen, I have some good news I'd like to share with you today. And that is that there's a God in heaven who loves you so much. He gave you the very best that heaven could give you. He gave you his son. And you know what he did? He loved you so much he gave you his life. And do you know why he gave you his life? Because there's only one way to get to heaven, and it's through faith in that finished work of Calvary. And so you go and share, but you go in the power of Christ. That's why even the very next word in verse 19, go ye therefore, the therefore is based on this authority that the disciples are sent to make disciples in all the world. So our authority, our authority for missions, it's not something that we just sat around and dreamed up on our own, like, well, hey, listen, uh, let's do missions. No, listen, that authority comes from the Lord himself. And you know why it's so important that it comes from the Lord himself? Because God loves missions. It is something that is near and dear to the very heart of God. If I were to ask you who is the greatest missionary ever to walk the face of the earth, we are often inclined to say Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle was, no doubt, a great missionary. But there was one greater than the Paul the Apostle. And that is none other than the Lord Jesus himself. In the book of Hebrews, you needn't turn there, but Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible tells us, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The apostle, the one sent, who has become our high priest, is Christ Jesus. So God loves, so mission, loves missions so much that he participated in the program. He created it. He designed it. He gave us the very best missionary that we could ever have. This missionary, as already indicated, is sent with a purpose. Missions has purpose. Jesus, the Bible tells us, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's the greatest missionary on a mission. What was his mission? Seek and save the lost. That's his mission. And you know, he never lost sight of that. The very first words that are recorded from Christ in Scripture is I must be about my father's business. Luke chapter 2, he was probably the ripe age of about 12. It's guesstimated. And at the age of 12, remember, he stays behind and he's in the temple. His parents have taken off to head back to Nazareth. And they, they get so far down the, the road, they realize, hey, our son is in here with us. Been there, done that a time or two with our kids. We have kept trying to give our kids away over the years, but they keep finding a way back home. I've told you all the funny stories where we left them at a zoo, a baseball, the, let's see, down in Philly at the stadium down in Philly, uh, a church. We left one at a church. Hey, that was a good place to leave one of our kids. Uh, uh, and that was a long way, too, till we finally figured that one out. Uh, but anyway, they, they keep finding their way back home, and we're okay with that, too. But listen, this one here came. He was left behind, and he's in there, and he's teaching these rabbis. He's teaching these, these elder statesmen. He's teaching all these Jewish people uh, 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 the Word of God. And uh, his parents come back and they're like, well, you, 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 you gave us some, some serious heart problems here. And, and uh, what are you doing? And Jesus' response is, I must be about my father's business. Hey, question, what is the father's business? Seek and save the lost. And at the ripe age of 12, Jesus was already beginning his ministry. Now, that's all we have prior to his public ministry at the age of 30. But uh, listen, he was mindful of it at a young age. 
And do you know how he finished his ministry? He finished his ministry on the cross with the words, It is finished. Hey, folks, his mission was complete. He finished the job. Well done, son. No doubt the father would say to his son as he arrived home. Hey, listen, Jesus, a missionary, on a mission to seek and to save. And he began that work. He was mindful of that at a young age. Never lost sight of it. Died on the cross, completing the mission, and saying, it is finished. It's over. And into our, in his presence, he would ascend a short time later. This God, who is our authority, he is sovereign. Sovereign in that he sends. This is interesting. I found this interesting. Already indicated in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, the word apostle appears there. And again, study it in the original language. It means one cent. But you don't even have to go to that passage of Scripture. You can go to some different places in the Gospel of John. For instance, in John chapter 6, verse, 7, uh, verse 57, the Bible says, As the living Father hath sent me. That's the words of Christ. And Christ is making a reference to what God has done. And he acknowledges... My Father sent me. It's the same word, apostle. It's the same word we get missions from. Now, missions does come from a Latin word uh, when, when the translations were taking place. So the English word missions come from Latin. But if you study the concept of missions, it comes from a Greek word, which means one sent. And it's translated sent, or it's translated apostle, but it's the same idea. And Jesus is one that recognized time and again. He would say in John chapter 7, verse 29, But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. He has sent me. I am a missionary. I'm a sent one. It's the same word. So being the authority, being sovereign, he sends individuals. He sent his son. And guess who else he sends? He sends us. And that's what the rest of this gospel here says. If you look at here, verse uh, 19, we've already pointed out here, go ye therefore. Who's, that, who's, he, who's this addressed to? Well, it's addressed to the disciples that are with him, but the broader application would be for all of us. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This great commission is repeated five times over in, in the New Testament. It's repeated in each of the Gospels. And if we took time, we could look at Mark uh, 16, and I believe it's uh, Luke chapter 24, and John chapter 20, and the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We're studying that in our evening services. Hey, listen, the commission, the responsibility to go into the world has been repeated over and over and over again in Scripture, which says to us, it's pretty important to God. God is the authority for missions here at Kendall Park Baptist. He is sovereign. He sent his son. He sends individuals today. And the individuals he's sending are certainly those that are sitting here today. But in a sense, in a sense, he does have a special call upon some individuals. Not everybody is called to go to the Ivory Coast. Not everybody is called to go to Israel. Not everybody is called to go to Spain or France or wherever else. Only certain individuals. You know, uh, you know uh, my situation, our situation, the uh, Lord has blessed us. We have 10 children. We're so blessed. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that a number of them are all serving the Lord. But out of 10, only one, only one since God calling him to missions. Only one out of 10. Now, that's just in my family. But, but in church families, we would love to see God's call upon your life. And maybe you surrender and say, hey, listen, count me in. I'm one that's going to the mission field. I sense God again burning me. And we could study all about that call of God. But it's a unique call. It's a special call. And that call, again, is uh, very specific. You could see some of this in various passages of Scripture in the New Testament. For instance, Peter and Andrew. You know these texts. The Lord Jesus is walking by. What does he say? Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Now listen, how many people were fishing that day? I have no idea. But I do know this. Two people, by name, singled out, called to serve God. You, Peter, you, Andrew, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Hey, by the way, there's the authority. He's the one that gives us the authority to go. They're not just going on their own, on their own free will. No, God has called them. A very specific call. And this call is repeated over and over again in different places of Scripture. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew sitting at receipt of custom, he, Christ, saith unto him, follow me. 
Now, how many other people were sitting there paying their taxes that day? And he didn't go up and say, hey, by the way, I want all of you to come with me. No, he singled out one individual. Matthew, you, follow me. A tax collector, fisherman, a doctor. Individuals that were, again, called. Uh, we could look at uh, a couple passages of Scripture, but for the sake of time, we'll pass with that. But I want you to know that God is the authority behind missions at Kendall Park Baptist Church, and we simply want to just be in line with His program, His plan, and His plan is missions. I love the story of William Carey, who is known as the father of modern missions. The year is 1787, when he suggests to friends and people around him that God has called him to go and serve in full-time missions. Do you know how that was met in 1787? One older gentleman sat him down and said, Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid and mine. Now, isn't that a great encouragement? Hey, I think God is, is working on my heart. I, I don't understand it. I, I don't know all about it. I'm not very familiar with it. But I know this, God is doing something, and I just got to go. I just got to go. And so a few years later, he starts this agency, the Baptist Mission, Missionary uh, Society. That was five years later. He was undeterred, praise God, for the boldness and the courage of individuals that, that will not take no for an answer, will not be silenced by senior individuals that, that really don't understand what God is doing. This individual is going to go on. He'll form an agency. And therein will come his most famous, probably his most famous line that he has shared and has been used in, in missions conferences and pastors and missionaries for years. He quotes, or I quote him, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Hey, folks, my question to you with regard to missions is, what do you expect God to do? What do you expect God to do in Israel? What do you expect God to do in the Ivory Coast? What do you expect God to do behind a camera lens? What do you expect God to do? Hey, if we have no expectation, nothing will get done. But if you expect great things from God, you can accomplish great things for God. It takes faith, and you step out in faith. And so here this guy is trying to be deterred, none of by the devil, I believe, using a person. But he's not going to take no, and so he packs his bag and he heads off to India. And while getting in India, he's again trying to get established in a culture and a language and things of that sort. His son comes down with a dysentery and ends up dying on the field. His wife has some serious mental issues and becomes a serious burden for him. But neither of those would deter this man. Hey, God has called me to missions. I am on a mission. I have come to India to seek and to save the lost. And so be it my own family, my own flesh and blood, my wife, who I love dearly. Hey, listen, let God be as God. If you see fit to take him, I'm not being deterred from the mission. And so William Carey will spend the next 20 years learning the language and translating several different uh, state languages uh, into uh, taking, taking the Bible and translating it into the language of the people of that day. It would be, I think, uh, if I got all my numbers here correctly, it would be 1793. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 1800. So 13 years after he sensed the call of God, and he ends up in India, it would be 13 years later before he saw his first convert to Christ. Now, if that wouldn't discourage you, I mean, hey, I'm knocking on doors, as it were, to use our modern day uh, uh, terminology, and I'm sharing Christ as best I can as I fumble through learning the language, and, and I'm just sharing Christ, and I'm doing what I can, and I'm writing the, the, the Bible out for these people, and year after year after year goes by, and nobody's getting saved. I mean, you talk about discouragement, but that didn't side rail this guy. This guy was on a mission, and he would not be deterred. And so, 13 years after he sensed the God's call, he wins his first convert to Christ in India. But the good news, folks, is, and sometimes we stop short here, the work that he did, he laid a foundation. He translated the Bible into the various state languages all there in India. And so that people that would come on his heels could be able to pick up and build on William Carey's work. And souls would get saved by the groves. Hey, listen, there are Indian families in our church today that are very grateful for missions. You know why? Because you know that missionaries... Thomas is the one that's often referred to by way of tradition, came to India, preached the gospel, and as a result, 
primarily the southern part of India, is, is, a, is, is primarily Christian. It's a, it's a wonderful story. But listen, that didn't come without a price to pay, whether it be for Thomas or William Carey's or whoever followed in their heels. But I'm thankful for people that, again, had a burden to go. And you know why they went? Because God was the authority who had called them to go. And who are we to argue with God? How about our assets? Our assets for missions here at Kendall Park Baptist. I want to tell you something about Kendall Park Baptist, and we're blessed. Kendall Park Baptist has a history. It's a good history. It's a history of being very generous. This is not limited to this year. This has been for years. Kendall Park has always risen to the occasion with regard to supporting worldwide missions. They've done a phenomenal job. Very, very generous. And for that, I am blessed. This past conference that we had, you know, I had a goal of, uh, of uh, seeing that each of our missionaries at least receive a $1,000 love offering uh, from our congregation. I think that's been exceeded. I, I think that the, the love gifts that have come in from our people is just incredible. And so we're able to now write a check for each of the missionaries and say, hey, listen, hey, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. By the way, here's a little bit of compensation for your time. And uh, this is just a love offering. We take care of their travel expenses on top of that. And so uh, the, the church has been very generous. And we're, we're right in step with where the church has been for years. Such a blessing to be a part of a church that, again, realizes that, hey, listen, these are servants of God, and we need to take good care of them. And, and you do that over and over and over again, and you did it here just recently. The premise that I would like to use if I had time would be that same text that Sam read for us out of the book of Philippians chapter 4 here today, but I'm just going to condense it for you. It wasn't too long ago on a Wednesday night we spent some time studying that text, and I'm blessed with the book of Philippians. But he talked about how Epaphroditus brought this gift. And Paul is sitting in a prison cell in Rome, and he's receiving another love gift from the church at Philippi. A local church at Philippi has a burden for for this, the, the missionary Paul, and his mission field right now is a prison place in Rome. Whether he's under house arrest or whether he's actually in a cell remains to be seen. I know he was in the palace uh, for a while as well there. Anyway, they send a gift. And, and Paul responds with these words. He says, the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He is complimenting, complimenting the, Philipp the, the Philippians. And he said, hey, listen, what you did for the cause of Christ is tremendous, and God is well-pleased. God is blessed by your generosity. And he's encouraging them, thank you, but hey, listen, to God be the glory for what he has done. And then he reminds them of this truth. He says this, but my God shall supply all your need. Hey, you gave, but I want you to know this. Our God is able to supply you. You thought you, I don't have it, I don't know. In faith, I'm going to step out, I'm going to put this into play, I'm going to take care of these folks. And you know what God does for you? He puts it back in your pocket. I don't know how, some way, some way. It's not always necessary in greenbacks, but I've often used the illustration being in ministry all the years and stuff like that. I've seen God do incredible things. I tell people about the cars I've driven over the years. I had five clunkers. They weren't good cars. They were clunkers. Of course, I had, I had young kids driving. I'm not going out and buying those kids new cars. And so uh, we had clunkers. But somehow, God kept those clunkers running from time and time again. They just kept on moving down the road. I don't know how they did it. Uh, my one son would say, why do we got a bunch of junk cars? I said, well, you can afford better. You get better cars. That's up to you. But for now, it's my car. It's my dime. You drive what you got. I, I think about teeth. You go to the dentist, you know what it costs to go to the dentist today? And there's not a lot of insurance plans that really take care of dentistry. But somehow, someway, our kids' teeth survived. I don't know how that happened. So listen, I'm not saying that it's always a greenback. I, I don't give $100 and he gives me $200. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But sometimes he says, you know those teeth? Hey, you know what? I'm going to get an extra mile or two out of those teeth before you have to go and see it. I don't know how, but I know this. You can't outgive God. You know why? Because he said... My God shall supply all your need. And you know what? It's in accordance with his riches. It's not out of his riches. How wealthy is God, folks? He is the wealthiest. Hey, if it was, if it was my God shall supply all your need from his riches, that would be, here's the illustration. You heard me use this before. 
Let's see, who's the, who's the richest now on earth? Is it Elon, Elon Musk? I don't know what he is. Let's just talk, talk about Elon Musk. Hey, if he gave from his riches, he might send us, hey, he might send us uh, uh, $100,000 and say, hey, listen, I heard you want to put a new building up somewhere down the road here. Hey, here's $100,000. And we'd say, whew, thank you, Mr. Musk. We really appreciate that. But Mr. Musk really gave from his riches. Hey, suppose that Mr. Musk wanted to give according to his riches. Ooh, you know what that might be? That might be a hundred million. Ooh, that put up several buildings for us. Uh, if he gave in accordance with his wealth, there's a difference than giving from his wealth. You know what the scripture says in Philippians 4.19? But my God, you who gave to missions in, in Philippi, hey, my God shall supply all your need, and all your need will be according to his riches in glory. Hey, listen, I want to tell you something. That's an incredible truth. And he closes that text with a doxology, and rightly so. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. God gets glory. Hey, folks, the assets that we have at this church are incredible. I want to let you know that um, if you total this all up, and I meant to do some research and check, and I keep saying I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and I didn't do it. Uh, I want to just tell you this, though. Um, this is only a portion of the giving that really is reflected by way of missions. Our, our giving toward missionaries and special um, uh, speakers that we have from time to time is probably somewhere about in the area of 20% of all the income that we receive in a year. Somewhere in the area of co uh, close to 20%. So that means for every $100,000, let's see, that's what, $20,000 going out to missions, right? So, so that's how that works. That's a pretty good percentage because some people say, well, we should tithe on it. Well, we do better than tithe. We're giving close to 20%. And let, let, me, let me tell you how we do that. There are a number of different ways. Craig Hartman is coming next Sunday night. We will have a love play for him. He's one of our missionaries. We support Craig Hartman. We want to let him know, hey, thank you for coming to be with us here. Here's a love gift. Uh, coming on the heels of him will be Dave Korn. He'll come do vacation Bible school. Now, he's more in the area of an evangelist, but hey, listen, there will be a love offering. The last love offering that we gave to a mission or to a vacation Bible school last year was like $3,800 or maybe it was over $4,000 for a, a team. Remember the Merles that came? And you guys were incredibly generous to the Merles that came. And so you put that in there with the, the gifts to the missionaries. We have Raymond Abu Mikhail coming in November. Uh, we have Jeffrey Polanco coming in December. So these are missionaries that... By the way, I can't always schedule them. They call me and tell me when, hey, they're free or they're coming to the States. And so, hey, we'll be glad to have you. We support those missionaries. And when they come, we always have a love offering. You add all of that together, in addition to what we give them on a regular basis, it's phenomenal. I think it's a great, generous church. And so, listen, the assets that we have at Kendall Park Baptist Church, it's right here. It's right here today. And to God be the glory for the work he's doing. Now, listen, I would love to spend some time here because the last time we did this, here's this little pamphlet, okay? This little pamphlet, I really hope that you're going to read it. This little pamphlet really deals with what we call our, our, our program, FEM. F stands for Faith, E, Enrichment, M, Missions. You ever hear of, uh, in fact, uh, our speaker, I think O'Malley, said you don't do Faith Promise. Faith Promise is a program that's very popular with regard to missions. I'll take another day to explain that. We do a derivative of it. It's called Faith Enrichment Missions. Our giving is by way of faith. Um, when you give, you give uh, with, with the intent that, hey, listen, I believe in faith that what I have is from God. And now, God, you have blessed me. I'm giving it back to you. By the way, um, we used to pass the offering plates uh, in our worship services. The COVID came. We stopped doing all that kind of stuff. And now we have plates here. We have one in the foyer. And you folks have not skipped a beat with any of that as well. So nothing's changed by way of the amount coming in. You guys, again, very generous. But some of you might wonder, like, uh, we're, we've debated whether we want to incorporate that back into our services again or just leave it the way it is. And I, we're leaning toward just leaving it the way it is. But to incorporate it in our service was never like a commercial timeout. Like, oh, by the way, okay, it's offering time. Hey, ushers, will you come on down, pick up the plates, pass the plates around? And it was always part of our worship. And you know why it's part of our worship? Because when, whatever we put in that plate, we are saying to God. We're really saying to ourselves, but we're saying to God, I believe, Lord, what, what I am putting in the plate has come from you in the first place. And Lord, this is just a portion of what you've given me. And so it really is, it's really a demonstration of faith to ourselves. A, a demo, it's, it's an act on our own part, saying, I truly believe. I believe with all of my heart. Just as I believe that Jesus is God, I believe just the same way that everything I have is from God. I believe that. Amen? Amen. Yes. Okay, so he's given us everything, from health to material wealth, whatever it may be. It all belongs to him. We're just simply stewards. And then he says, 
But here, what, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give some of that back. Oh, Lord, you don't understand the bills I have. Oh, yes, he does. You know why? He's sovereign. He's God. He knows everything. He knows what you have. Well, Lord, I got some, I got some big things, and I just, uh... hey, listen, faith. Where's your faith? We trust the Lord. We are people saved by faith. We walk by faith. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You, you can't live a Christian life without faith. So, so listen, it translates into every part of our life. And so it includes our giving. And so we give by faith. Enrichment. Uh, we, we certainly, again, want to be part of the, the process of uh, blessing others. Uh, and as we do this, we, we grow in our understanding. Hey, I have to tell you a quick story. Boy, I could be here for all day. You know, I got saved later in life. I didn't understand anything about tithing. I really didn't. Uh, I, I, knew, I went to church. I saw my father always put money in the offering plate. And by the way, he was a really neat dad. I, I love my dad for so many reasons. But you know what he would do? Uh, he, he had envelopes for the kids. All of us kids had envelopes. But he put the money in the envelope for us. And so, and then when it came to the offering time, he'd pass out all these envelopes. So here comes the offering basket, and oh, us kids would put this offering, like, hey, look what I did. I don't even know how much was in those envelopes. I, don't, I had nothing to do with those envelopes. It was just dad taking care of business, and, and he wanted the kids to understand that, hey, listen, you have a responsibility to do something. But he never challenged us, though. Hey, hey, that money you earned this week from mowing lawns, did, are you going to give any of that to God this week? He never challenged us that way. He just dutifully filled the envelopes and passed them at the time of the offering, and we all put something. I learned something from that, though. But I know this. So I had to grow in my understanding about, ooh, everything, ooh. Hey, Lord, I got, I got lots of kids. I got lots of bills. Yep, I think God knows that. Where's your faith, brother? Where's your faith? Hey, listen, and as you go and you give, as God asks us to give, you know what happens? We grow. We grow. We give that money, and it's like, whew, I never missed it. I, I don't know how that happened. Uh, my bills are still paid at the end of the month. Uh, we're still living very well. I don't know. Hey, I'm going to give more. And you know what happens at the end of the week? Hey, God bless. All the needs are met. It's incredible. It's incredible. I want to encourage you. Try it out. If you've never done it, check it out. God is good. Hey, God will enrich your life when you trust him in all areas of your life, including the area of giving. And by the way, you know, giving is probably one of the most difficult areas. We can give God a lot. But when it comes to our money, mm, do you know, uh, you know these athletes that make buku bucks? By the way, did you see UNC destroy Duke last night? They didn't quite destroy them. Okay, but they beat them. That was a big upset. Villanova lost. That was pretty bad. So anyway, tune in tomorrow night. You'll see. Uh, hey, uh, you know these athletes that make buku, and by the way, not the college, but the pros. You know, I, I grew up hearing, hey, you, gotta, you know, when you, you want to find these individuals, you want to you teach them a lesson, I always heard this expression. Hit them where it hurts. Where does it hurt? Right here. Right here in the pocketbook. And so they slap these big fines on these athletes. And I'm thinking, what's a $100,000 fine to that guy that's making $10 million a year? You know, that's still chump change. Nope. It's still $100,000 out of their pocket, and they didn't like it. Hey, listen, I think when it comes to finances, we get really pretty defensive, and we get guarded. But faith enrichment allows us to grow in our understanding and giving. And then the uh, idea of missions, well, we've already talked about some missions. Hey, I want you to take a look at this thing, how to prioritize your giving. We could spend a lot of time dealing with it. We are out of time with that. But, but listen, the assets, FEM really deals with how we generate money to support the missionaries. And listen, the more that comes in that's earmarked FEM, by the way, you write a check or you do it online and you designate tithe versus missions, it's those missions money that will, again, go on and support missionaries. So let's say, we, let's say we wanted to support all four missionaries that were with us here, $800 a month. Let's just say pick 200. How's that, where's it going to come from? Well, you know how that comes? It says, you guys believe in missions, therefore I'm going to give more to missions so that we can do more with missions. We can give to more missionaries as they go with the gospel. So it's based on how the church responds in our giving. And I want to encourage you to plan, to pray, uh, to thoughtfully give on a regular basis to missions. That helps us with regard to our planning as we go forward. And uh, that's very, very important. Uh, in addition to that, there is so much out of our general fund that we designate for missions as well. But listen, that's uh, FEM. I hope that you'll take some time to read it quickly. Uh, we are about out of time, but I want you to understand the autonomy of missions here. 
at Kendall Park Baptist Church, the autonomy. Boy, that's a big fancy word. Anybody know what the autonomy means? It simply means self-governing. It has this idea that, that as a local church, there is no external control over us. Who are we answerable to right here? The people that are here today, who do you have to answer to? Not to Pastor Brown. We answer to the Lord. And you know who else we answer to? One another. That's what a Baptist church is all about. We believe in the, the autonomy of the local church. We are answerable to the Lord. So whatever decisions we make, we will stand before Him someday and give an account for it. So whatever decisions. And the decisions are made by the body of believers right here. There's no hierarchy outside of our church. There's nobody that tells us, hey, you need to support this person. There's nobody that tells us to do that. You need to do this. Nobody tells us. We are an independent, self-governing body of believers. That's a Baptist distinctive. And, uh, and I personally like it. And I like it because it's biblically based. If you study missions in the New Testament, you could go to the book of Acts, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 14. You could go to a number of passages. I have all of them written out here for us. And uh, I'm not going to be out of the time to do justice to it. But I want you to know this. Maybe, maybe just look at one real fast so you know that I'm not making this up. I want you to go to Acts chapter 13 real quick. It's probably one of the clearest passages in Scripture. Acts chapter 13, really, really fast, because we are really out of time. You're being so patient, and I feel bad for our life group leaders here. Quickly, Acts chapter 13. I want you to see this. Beginning in verse 1, real fast here. The Bible says, Acts 13, verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Antioch... There's a local church. This is Antioch of Syria. There are two Antiochs in Scripture. There's one in a place called Pisidia. There's one in Syria. This is Antioch in Syria. There were in this church at Antioch it's, uh, 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 in Syria certain prophets and teachers. Here's the names of these individuals. Barnabas was there. Simeon was there. That was called Niger. Uh, there was Lucius of Cyrene. There was Manian, which had been brought up at Herod the Tetrarch. And there was Saul. Do any of those names jump out at you real fast? There should be two names that jump out of that list of, of teachers and prophets that were there at the local church in Antioch. That would be Barnabas, Saul. Look what it says, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I called them. Hey, why didn't he say that to Simeon or, 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 uh, or, uh, 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 Simeon or Lucius of Cyrene? I don't know. All I do know is God put his finger on two individuals in particular, one named Barnabas, one named Saul. Saul would later become Paul. And he says to these two individuals, I'm separating you. I'm calling you out from the local church in Antioch because I have a specific mission for you. He calls these individuals out. It says here in verse 2, uh, verse 3, and when they, who is the they? The local church at Antioch, had fasted and prayed and laid their hands, who's the their, the local church, on them, that's Paul and Barnabas. They, the local church, sent them away. They being sent forth goes in uh, to these different areas and begins missionary journey number one for the Apostle Paul. But I want you to see this. It was the local church that was involved in that process. It was the local church that, that had these servants of the Lord, and they're, by, by the way, by the way, God calls people that are already busy and serving the Lord. He doesn't call stagnant Christians. Hey, listen, it might be a warning. You get involved in serving the Lord, watch out what God might do to you. But it's a good thing. Uh, that's how we ended up in ministry. I had no desire to go into ministry. I'm not from a ministry-type home. I'm a first-generation Christian. But I know this. We got saved. We just started serving God. Wherever we could, whatever was needed. What, what do you need me to do? I'll be glad to do it. God said, great, now do this. Okay, I'll do that. Hey, what else you want? Do this. And God said, hey, I want you to leave and go up here and pastor a church for me. Lord, who am I? So he calls individuals. Paul and Barnabas were already serving in the local church in Antioch. And then the Holy Spirit says, you two, I got a job for you. And they surrender. They go. But the church is involved in the process. They recognize it. They lay, lay hands on them. Not that they in, in, bestowed any kind of mysterious power. The idea of laying hands on it is an act of identification. Hey, remember the Old Testament sacrifices real quick, folks? Remember when you brought an Old Testament sacrifice to the, the uh, tabernacle or to the temple? You, you laid hands on that animal before it was slaughtered. And you know what you're saying? 
This animal I am identifying with. This animal is going to take my sin that has separated me from God, take my sin. I'm identifying by laying hands. I'm not transferring any power. There's nothing mystical about my hands. I'm just simply saying this animal is becoming my substitute. I'm, I'm, I'm identifying with it. Local church, Paul Barnabas, let's lay hands on you. We're identifying with you as representatives of this church in Antioch. You are going to be sent forth from this church with our blessing, with our prayer support, with, yea, our financial support. We're going to do all we can to see God use you in tremendous ways as you go on this mission of seeking and saving the lost. And with that, off they go. And that is repeated a number of times in the New Testament. So the autonomy of the local church sits right here today. The believers, the members at Kendall Park Baptist have a say in who we'll support. So we already mentioned the four missionaries that were here. Well, I know, I already heard from you that there's interest in supporting at least one or maybe more of those missionaries. I don't know what we're going to do. I'm not a prophet. I can't see the future, but we're going to talk about it. That's what we do at these business meetings. And, uh, and then we're going to come to a decision as a church. Okay. And by the way, I have to tell you, Pastor Brown has not always had his way with regard to some of these. I remember with a number of different missionaries, man, I was like, hey, I want to support this one personally. I'd like to support this one. We get together at the church and they say, but Pastor, we really like this one. And others say, yep, I like that one too. Hey, Pastor Brown, we like yours, but we like this one better. Okay. It's the self-governing body that makes the final decision. It's not Pastor Brown. Now, I'll certainly give you some guidance and some thoughts, but the bottom line is the church makes those decisions. Hey, listen, folks, this is all missions at KB, KPBC. The authority, the assets, and the autonomy of the local church. It's important. And I hope that that will help serve you with regard to understanding what is missions about here. How, how, do these, how, do, how do these 13 names get on a sheet of paper here? How do we get to know them? Well, they came, they visited, presented, we got burdened with them, prayed about it, and decided we're getting on your team. And so off they go. And, uh, and then they continue to keep us in the loop as to what's happening, just like we heard today from the Scherzers. Uh, and and uh, I hope that those missionary spotlights will be proven to be successful in the sense that they're trying to keep you aware of what's going on around the world by way of worldwide New Testament missions. And uh, that's important. Let's pray. Oh, Father, a lot of time. And uh, thank you for the uh, attention, the interest the support of our people with regard to missions. Lord, we are blessed here at Kendall Park. We're not a huge church, but Lord, we have big hearts. Uh, we, have, uh, we, have a, we have a vision. We have a big vision, Lord. Our vision is what you have for the world. Uh, we want to see souls get saved. We want to see churches established. We want to see pastors uh, taught and trained and encouraged and strengthened. Lord, we got a big job at hand. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray you help us to continue to be a part of your program. It's yours, not ours. We're privileged to be a part of yours. Missions is your idea. And Lord, you've allowed us to, to be included in the process of, of being blessed by different individuals that come our way and present burdens. And Lord, we have some decisions to make as we go forward. And we're, we're looking to you for wisdom and for understanding and direction. And so I pray that you prepare our hearts for even some discussion, further discussion this coming Wednesday and then later in the month. And Lord, I pray you'll continue to bless our giving with regard to missions. Oh, I pray we'll never rob Peter to pay Paul. We don't have a strong local church, Lord. We can't do missions, so continue to bless us with the support of the ministry here. But Lord, again, as we enlarge our vision to getting the, the gospel into all the world. Lord, uh, the sign of the times, it's, it's getting more bleak. Not that I'm a pessimist, but Lord... It's looking like you're coming back, and Lord, time is running out. Time is of the essence, and I pray that you help us to be about the work you want us to be doing for your, for your glory. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've taught us here this morning or reminded us of. And we want to give thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, folks, uh, we're going to take.